and welcome. This is our fourth Ask the Expert series, and today we're going to talk about photography. I'm Meredith Nierman. I'm the Director of Photography at WGBH, where I oversee photography for our local newsroom, as well as provide photography for many of our television and radio productions. Many thanks to all of you who are joining us today, including our leadership circle and our LS members. We really appreciate your continued support and are very happy to have you with us. Your support makes something like this possible, so thank you. Before we get started, I'll explain how this works. Many of you may be new to Zoom. Many of you may have spent the last three months of your life on it, but we want to make sure you have a great experience today. So here's a little bit of housekeeping. You, our audience, will not be on video and you will not be able to speak, but we do want to hear from you and we know you have questions. So when we move to the Q&A, you can ask your question in the Q&A tab. I'm pointing down. It's on the bottom of your screen and you should type your question in there. If you see another person's question in there and you really like it and you want it answered, you can vote for it um, by clicking the thumbs up. And that should get us going. So before I introduce Crystal, I want to introduce the team behind the scenes here at WGBH. They're making all of this work. And I can tell you, even though they make it seem seamless, it is a lot of work. Um, they will be pulling the strings and connecting with you, but you will not hear or see them. So first up is my colleague, Abby, who's our events producer. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us. Can't wait to have you and here for the next hour. Great. And Suzanne will be keeping an eye on our Q&A tab. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. When you're submitting your questions, definitely let us know where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear from you. Great. Thank you. So now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our expert guest, Crystal Milner. Crystal is actually in LA right now. So I think she's had her tea or coffee, but thank you for getting up early to start your day with us. Like starting your day with a few hundred people is probably not something you do normally, but um, we really, really thank you for that. So um, good morning. Um, I'll give you a little background on Crystal. Crystal is the photo editor for STAT. A California native, Crystal graduated with a master's degree in journalism from Boston University, where she received the Christopher John Weigel Memorial Award for Excellence in Visual Journalism. Prior to joining the STAT team, she worked as a freelance photographer for Blavity and the Los Angeles Wave newspapers. When she's not photo editing and photographing, she enjoys giving back to her community, volunteering and mentoring in her free time. And I can tell you, I've been following Crystal's work for a couple of years now, and she's really, really talented and thoughtful. And I think you'll see some of that today as um, we speak with her. So again, good morning, Crystal. Good morning. I have to confess that when the camera came on, came on I got a little nervous. Mm -hmm. um, and besides that, I think that most people don't know that photographers are secretly shy people. Um, it also reminded me of um, how photography, a camera, is a tool for seeing and mm -hmm. how powerful that can be. Right. And so that's what we're here to talk about today. There's a lot that goes into that, but um, that, is, that is sort of the topic at hand. So our audience is going to have a lot of questions for you, but I just wanted to kick it off with a few so people could have a better sense um, of who you are. And then also, I think you're going to briefly, quickly show us a couple of photo essays you've done. This is such a visual topic. It's, we both felt it was really important to kind of ground the conversation and actually some visual things. So tell us about STAT and what you do there. Sure. So STAT is a medicine, health, and science publication. We cover everything from pharma to uh, patients and basically how that's affecting them from medications to hospitals. Um, and at STAT, I started back in January of this year. So it's been an interesting start because I've been basically covering all things COVID from like literally the start of when I started at STAT, which has been really interesting and very fun and like really thrilling um, and eye-opening at the same time. I always tell people that some of the first photographs that I was like pulling for stories at STAT as a photo editor um, were in Wuhan and that's when it was like considered more like pneumonia and kind of, you know, we we're just trying to figure out what exactly this illness was. Um, and then slowly it began to like 
creep closer and closer to like the United States. So it was really surreal seeing that um, being the photo editor at STAT, this health science and medicine publication. So. Right. So I have a big question for you, but you need to give a brief answer for now. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's just um, because uh, I know this is a big question when I'm asked and I never have a brief answer. So you could at least start to answer it is sort of wh why photography? Like what, what is it about <laughs> photography and photojournalism? Yeah, no, that's, yeah, it's totally not a brief. The short of it is um, I started to fall in love with it when I told this story back in college that had to do with going visiting my grandma's house in Compton and basically being able to tell that story of what Compton was to myself and my family through photography that that's kind of really what jump started like the love of it all okay wonderful mm -hmm. um as you and I have been talking because we do know each other um you work even though you're in LA right now um stab is in Boston so you work out of Boston so we know each other from okay. from the community here um, and one of the things we often talk about is that photography, um, you know, it requires sort of two things to come together, which is the technical and then the conceptual and sort of you can have one, but if you don't have the other, you know, your pictures are only going to be so good. And so I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit, like when we say technical, what are the kinds of things mm -hmm. that people might think about? And then when we say conceptual. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that first comes to mind with technical is just like, I think this can even be done on like an iPhone or probably any smartphone these days, um, using your grid and using that as like a rule of thirds and kind of placing your subject in one of the intersections of that grid. Um, so that the eye kind of like starts at that subject and then moves around. I think that's composition is like one of the basics and i think that our phones are so technically advanced technology like is so advanced right now um you're able to learn that composition from your phone and i think from there grow into like a dslr or like something something else um and then conceptual i think of like some sort of storytelling through at least that one photograph like what is the point of this photo or like what question is being answered through this photo so right so from what you're saying it's sort of like technical is we have a tool the camera and there are ways to use that tool that allow for quality good pictures all kinds of things go into that but yeah. then there's the you as the person with the eye coming in and noticing and then and then trying to translate a story or a piece of a story that you're seeing into an image yeah that's, um, it's a really nice starting point to think about it. I often remind myself that, that good pho photography is about both things and I need to keep working on both. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are already a ton of questions coming in. Should we switch over to them? Great, let's do that. I love the first one. Um, Robin wrote, hey, <laughs> what are different careers that, oh, where did it go? Sorry, it dropped down a little bit. Hey, what are different careers that you can pursue in photography? Mm -hmm. Sure. So I'm trying to think like one of the things that I first started out doing was I worked for Life Touch for a little while um, as, oh my gosh, it was like a church directory photographer, um, which was really helpful um, when it came to like posing and everything was very like static and like by the book for this um, when I was working at Life Touch. Um, but that was also helpful for as I've like gone on in my career, cause basically it helps you, it helps with like posing. Poses were like the same, if it was like a family of four, family of three, this is what you do. Um, but that's kind of where my mind goes first. Like life touch is like, I think a good jump start. Um, I would say something in education as well. Some sort of like after school program for photography is also great. Um, I would also go into, I would say like freelancing from anything having to do with like photojournalism to commercial photography um documentary um photography is also a field that you can go into so there are definitely options out there yeah you know crystal in my excitement to seeing all the questions come flying in and also my mom might be watching so i'm a little extra nervous <laughs> i forgot to cue you to show a little bit of your work so to the audience i apologize we're going to get back to those questions in just a few minutes but i do want everybody to see some of crystal's work because i think it it, you'll get to know her a little better too. And then some of these questions and answers will make even more sense. So sorry about that. That's okay. I'll go ahead and pull that up now. Okay. Oops. 
just one second. All right, is my screen showing now? I see it. You see it? OK. Yeah. All right, so I'll start with this because this is a, a recent project that I did for work. Um, and it basically spurred from like everything that's happening in the world right now from the coronavirus to what's happening with black folks here in America and the reckoning and like the uprising of like Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so I know that I just think of like my mental health during this time and like I wondered how other folks were feeling about everything that was going on um, working through this pandemic also being black and also working like what did that look like so basically um i came up with this project for work um and i photographed friends and family um and kind of talked to them about what this time means to them and how are they dealing with it um mentally what are they doing to cope what are they doing to try to feel better from day to day um you know were they feeling empowered were they feeling uplifted so these are all portraits this photo essay um and i think that there well there are a few types of things that you can do with photography but i think portraiture obviously is like one of them and then the other photo essay that i'll show you has to do more so with storytelling um so i and i do think that there's some storytelling through these portraits like looking at these people's eyes and kind of feeling what they're feeling in this moment um that was something that i thought was really important was to focus on people's eyes um, to really convey like the hurt, the pain, whatever was going on um, that they discussed in their interviews. Um, and that's one thing with portraiture, I think you have to be very intentional about what, what you want to convey, how you want the photo to feel. Um, you know, it's not all like one, two, three cheese. So, which is very important to remember when doing portrait photography. I think there's a couple more here. Lighting is very important too in portrait photography that also sets the mood and kind of the, sorry about that, um, the mood and like the feel for a project. Let me show you the other one here briefly. So this is an assignment that I did during um, grad school and it's about this, a black transgender woman who grew up in Dorchester, uh, Massachusetts. So this was more of a photo essay and from photo to photo, you kind of see a little, a different clip of Persia's like life. So this was her getting ready that morning. I think I met her at her house at like six o'clock in the morning um, before she got ready for work. And that's another thing about, I think uh, photo essays and like, visual storytelling really it's important for the subject or that person to trust you and allow you to come in and have that access or else it's hard to get these types of photos so i try to keep in mind with like each of these kind of what was the story that i was trying to tell as a whole and then what was the story that i was trying to tell it within each photograph and then for me, it was also important for each photograph to propel the story forward. This photo essay actually started out as something like, what does it look like for a trans person of color to exist in the United States in this time period? Um, which in the, I started this project in 2017. So I just wanted to know what did that look like? We were just, I mean, we always hear a lot of different things on the news. Um, so I wanted to see firsthand um, what was that like for someone in those sh in these shoes. Um, and then eventually, unfortunately, Persia did go through something that um, was a domestic uh, violence dispute. Um, and, you know, Persia shared with me and then we see it again on the news about how this is not um, you know, so many folks, it kind of experienced this. So yes, that is that photo essay. So thank you guys for checking that out.
I'm gonna stop sharing now, Meredith. Okay. So for our audience, you, in, in case you don't have the um, chat window open, the links to both of these photo essays are right there. So you can go to them now and have them on the side or you can look at them later. But um, thank you, Crystal. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing that jumps out at me the most when I look at those two essays again is how one, the first one, you're doing portraiture. It's very consistent portraiture, even though the portraits are different, mm -hmm. um, but you're still using it. You're taking a very consistent approach, um, yet there's so much story in each photograph. Like it, you're not just simply looking at a snapshot of a person. You, The photo itself gives you more about right. them. And then together they form a whole story. There's individual and a whole. And then your other essay is your in more traditional way telling a story through a series of images that almost have a you know a, a procession in some way and mm -hmm. have a variety so you sort of coming into detail coming back out of detail um showing her as she moves through part of her life and i i think that um it sort of highlights for me that um uh, that the importance of of sort of looking for meaning when you're taking an image in that way. And it can be through portraiture or something else. So mm -hmm. thank you. Um, now there are even more questions coming in. <laughs> so, um, so from Sean Collins, how do you handle taking pictures in public? Do you avoid faces? When, when do you have to ask permission? Do you make them sign something? How do you handle it if they say no? Sure. So, um, I think at one point I was a little more um, shy, I guess you could say, about photographing folks in public. Like, but I think you quickly realize that like the back of people's heads is like not going to do it. Like sometimes that's intentional, and like that can also be beautiful, like depending on the composition and like the lighting. Um, but really, I think what's important is to to get people's faces and to get people's reactions. Like I've been in spaces where um, I, I'm not, I don't necessarily look like the folks that I'm photographing. So that's part of like the way people interact with me and the way people interact with my camera being there is also part of like that story, I think. Um, I would say like, sometimes if someone is like really staring at me, really looking at me, either like I'll ask and say like, hey, I'm doing such and such project or like sometimes it's just for me. Sometimes it's like a a street photograph moment um sometimes i will let if i think like the moment or that interaction is very important like i'll just let the people know like hey i'm photographing for x y and z do you mind if i stand here and like take a couple of photos yada 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 sometimes it's yes sometimes it's no um if it's no you know i move to like the next moment um so i really don't i don't take it to heart too much and the other thing is with my project with Persia, eventually I did have it published. And because of the material and like the content and the things that she went through, we did have to sign, or I did have to have her sign like some sort of waiver if she was comfortable with that. She could have course, of course said no, um, but she did say yes, thankfully. Um, and, but for the most part, I usually, I'm not really walking around with like paperwork asking like folks to, to sign X, Y, and Z, so. I mean, with kids, I'm I'm very careful. Like, usually, I always like ask whatever like adult or like guardian is like nearby. Like, is this okay? This is what I'm doing. Yada yada yada. So, yeah, yeah, and I think I think you're highlighting a few key things, which is sort of as a photojournalist, it's your job to be out there and mm -hmm. to be documenting what's happening. And you know, there may be photojournalists or aspiring photojournalists in the mm -hmm. audience, but I'm guessing there are also just a lot of people who who want to go out and, and photograph. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I think as Crystal said, that if, if you are photographing a public event or you're in a public space, right. um, you are free to generally free to photograph. The, then the question then becomes like, are you going about it in a respectful, fair way? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, can, there's a lot of judgment involved, I think. It depends on what you're photographing. Mm -hmm. um, I and what I want to highlight what Crystal said too about children um, or if you are in a space that's not public but you've given permission absolutely make sure that anybody else who's in that space is if you're going to an event that releases have been signed or that they understand that you might be photographing right 
And one other thing too, Meredith, I want to mention is that, you know, I'm coming at this from like a photojournalist perspective and that's why, I don't know, I've been taught like different things. Sometimes like ask first or like do first and like apologize later. Um, just because with photojournalism, like you want to have like a candid moment and like not something that's forced. Um, you don't want folks to start uh, performing in front of the camera. So that's why usually I try to go ahead and photograph first and then I feel if I'm starting to get like weird looks either I'll um you know move straight forward and like ask that person ex if it's okay and then if not sometimes I'll move move on to like the next moment but I try not to interrupt the moment too much yeah. one of the things I also keep in mind is that you know having your picture taken has different meaning for different people and for uh, and culture culturally as well too and mm -hmm. you know we're not gonna that's a big topic um, but you absolutely can read about that online um, mm -hmm. And, it, you know, there are a lot of people having important conversations about that historically and now too, um, given a lot of things happening in the world. Um, so that's what I certainly would recommend on top of what Crystal said. All right, we're going to keep going and we're going to, I know we, we got a lot here. Um, let's go to something technical. Oh, this is always the big one. Uh, Ruth Becker, I would like to know how to set the basics. Aperture sh shutter speed ISO. Would, and then would you please show how to do this on a Canon camera? So we can't do it on a specific camera right now, but we can give you some basic info. And then we absolutely have a bunch of links waiting for you at the end of this that will give you a lot more info. It's a complex answer, but mm -hmm. Crystal? Sure, I would say, so the first thing I think of is, well, I think when I'm when I'm mentoring, um, I mentor some some young girls in East LA for this the Lost Photos project. And like one thing that we always tell the girls first is to start off in automatic. So start off in automatic, get comfortable, um, kind of you know pay attention to like composition and like pay attention to like where is the lighting come from coming from. And then from there, I would say you can bump it to either aperture priority or shutter priority so then you're only messing with i believe you know just like one of the settings i think you might also have to tweak iso i'm not for sure um so i would say auto and then kind of go to um either shutter priority or aperture priority and then from there i would say just try it out in manual like you know if you're using a dslr camera um you know that's kind of the luxury of it like you pretty much can photograph as much as you'd like. Um, you can delete as much as you like. You can, you know, try things out. So um, I would say with manual, um, you know, the things that I, I mess around with first are like shutter speed and then aperture. And then from there, I deal with ISO and I do ISO last just because um, the more, the higher your ISO is, the more like grain and noise you get in the photo. So that means you'll see like all these little dots and like specks in your photograph. Um, so I try my best to make the settings like to where I want them at first, just using uh, shutter speed and then aperture. Um, and then from there, like dial with the, the ISO, like so, so the ISO will bring in more light to your photograph, so. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the beginning of much <laughs> more. There's a lot more to say about that. Um, but where I would just add like one other thing. And then again, please look up, be on the lookout for, for more reading from us on this. But um, I think it's Crystal saying these three things work together um, to basically control how much light is coming in the camera and how quickly and then how quickly you're closing that shutter. And um, all of those things when played with create a different effect the effect in your photo will will adjust slightly depending on what you're doing. But I, I like what you're saying, which is like, go out and start um, doing a priority for one of these. So doing aperture priority or shutter. And then I, what I would add is like, do that and then really pay attention to what the photographs look like and then make an adjustment, adjust the aperture, take another photo of the same thing. Like, how does it vary, right? Like that will really help you start to understand how they work together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, a, it's all a triangle. So. It's a triangle. Yeah, you're going to see with the links that we sent, you're going to see a really important triangle. So um, <laughs> great. Well, here's another one um, from Sus Susan M. Hi, I have trouble when there is a difference in lighting. For example, the front of the image is filled with sunlight and the back is in the shadows. How do I adjust my DSLR settings so that one part of the image isn't too dark and the other too light? Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. So there's like, there's, I mean, there's a more complicated way to do this. Um, but I would say like the easier way is you want to focus on the subject in the front and usually everything will kind of work itself out in the background more likely. I'm, I'm trying to think what is an example of that. Um, and when you say focus, you mean so that you're what's called metering to the you're, you're sort of the light meter in the camera is then metering to that darker thing. Is that what you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of, so then it, it exposes for like the, the subject and as well as like the background, it will, I guess, compensate for both so that there's enough light to where you're seeing everything in brightness, like in enough light. So um, that's a little more technical and I'm trying to think those settings on like a camera, but if you look up metering, basically, you'll be able to figure out for your specific camera, how that works and how to like tweak it. I forget what the, like the variables or like the numbers are, but it's very like subtle from, from one number to like the next to like make that work together. I don't, that's probably not making as much sense, but um, if you, yeah, just, I would definitely say check out metering for your specific camera. And um, that would be like a good start in getting like those two to, to make a much better, to get your, the, the subject as well as like the background in better lighting. Right. I remember when I first started learning about metering and I realized that my brain meters for light so quickly and that a camera is trying to do the same thing but isn't a human brain. So like right. I'm looking in my apartment right now and there's a really bright window but a dark spot but I don't, I can kind of see everything because I'm constantly doing those adjustments. But like with a camera, you have to help your camera know what you're trying to focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I am going to Let's see, there are so many good questions here. Uh, Shannon wants to know, what is a dream story you hope to tell one day to be able to report it? What's a dream story you hope to be able to report on? Ooh, that's a good one. I, I think I wanna do just like more along the lines of like mental health. That's been like a story that I've always been interested in and originally like it started from like the perspective of like black women and the story of mental health and like the things that we carry um what does that look like for us and i, I kind of have this vision of like it being like a photo story but as well as like just like interviews um a montage of like interviews i think that's something that has always been on the back of in the back of my mind um another thing another big story that i've always really been interested in is like covering more of like Compton and like Watts which is where my parents grew up um and I think the reason why I've like held off on that a little bit part of it is because like I want to also have like historical photos involved in like whatever that project would look like um a lot of stuff I mean if if y'all haven't noticed has to do with like marginalized communities is what I'm truly interested in and um doing that storytelling and originally I thought that I wanted to do that storytelling for other people to like understand what that's like for like marginalized folks but I you know I've recently kind of changed that feeling and like I'm more interested in like sharing those stories so that marginalized communities feel more so like empowered I think um when I say Compton and Watts like there's this stigma around those two cities um and I just want to be able to share that that's not necessarily, that's not the truth about like those places. So um, anything having to do um, some sort of like storytelling, street photography with like Compton and Watts along with something having to do with like more going into a deeper dive with like mental health and like in the black community. And I just think there's like, just like history to that and kind of just doing this like long form like major project about all of that so somehow i feel like we're gonna see those stories uh down the line in print somewhere or rather online so look mm -hmm. forward to seeing them let's try to do a few quick rapid fire too just i, I got a lot of catching up here today mm -hmm. um what are some methods you use to help people who feel nervous in front of the uh in front of the camera how do you help them to get comfortable yeah so 
so normally like I'll just like I'll have a conversation I try to like talk maybe like the first couple of minutes during a session um and start to like photograph and usually I am truly testing out like the lighting and the scenery um but I am kind of starting to get like some really nice photographs of them um just talking in between speaking um because they're just like a lot more relaxed I would say and then the other tip quickly is um when doing like a photo essay doing like a pre-interview with somebody because you want to make sure that that person is someone that you truly want to photograph and that their story lines up with the what you're trying to convey in your project i think that's something else um sitting down with people without your camera is also very helpful in doing some sort of like photojournalism uh, project yeah yeah i mean what i hear and what you're saying is like spend some time don't just show up and pull up your camera and you know it's a really powerful thing and you know as as i noted i got a little nervous when the camera came on here because i can't see any of you i don't know anybody um and i always keep that in mind um and sort of photograph from that place i think mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that you are you are holding a lot of power when you hold that camera and you're photographing people. Um, I'll add one thing: if if you're photographing children, so you're doing portraiture, or um, I sometimes um, bring along a little camera, a little point and shoot, or something that I don't care about, and I sh give it to them and I say, "We're taking pictures today," and I let them take pictures of me. Um, you know, I once handed over my iPhone, which wasn't a good idea, so I don't recommend that, but. Um, and then I think also if you're not doing photojournalism, if you're doing photojournalism, you really can't show the people you're photographing the work that you're doing when it's in process. But if it's not photojournalism, you can show somebody what you're doing if you feel okay about that. Mm -hmm. I think that, that can help. The other, yeah, and to that, that just reminds me, Meredith, um, I think we chatted about this briefly, but um, just like, hey, like, okay, this looks great. Like, don't be creepy about it. But you know, like, okay, this is looking good. I like the way the light hits you here. Um, your facial expression is great. If you can do more of that, just kind of um, reiterating and reinforcing that, you know, they're looking great. And obviously, don't look in the back of your camera and like make some wonky like face, um, you know, just show that the uh, photo shoot is like going, going great and going smoothly. So. Yeah, and ask people how they're doing. I mean, right. mm -hmm. a chance to pause, right? There, there's just sort of. I think it's be present and be with people, and you know, almost like you would if somebody you know and care about, and mm -hmm. um, and and just keep in mind that they're having a very big experience around being photographed in some way. So, mm -hmm. all right, I'm not doing my rapid fire so well <laughs> here. Um, I'm running out of subjects to photograph. Perhaps I'm not being creative enough. Do you have any suggestions for how to get inspired with new topics? That's from William Anderson. Okay. I would say um, one, I guess like, well, you've already kind of said like, you're not sure, you're not, no longer interested, but I, I would say like, if you're just follow like whatever like sparks your interest, like whatever you're passionate about or whatever, like for me, again, like being a black woman covering marginalized communities, covering mental health, that's something that really interests me. And I guess mostly because it's an experience that I've had and I've grown up having that so i would say maybe if there's something like that that kind of could spark your interest um the other thing is like again you know being a journalist like paying attention to the news and like oh hmm, like that's a interesting story or like you know sometimes especially like on broadcast news like everything goes so quickly um so if you see something on broadcast news and you're like that would be like a very interesting story to um have some more detail about i would say you know, reach out to an organization where you think you might find that person. Um, those are some of the, the things I think. And then even just like walking around your neighborhood and just like sitting on a bench when it's not COVID and talking to your neighbor, um, talking to somebody in the park, um, which I, I know can be a little daunting, but you know, there's a lot of different characters out there. So just keep your eyes and ears open. Yeah, stories are everywhere. Even, mm -hmm. in, even in like what you might think is the mundane all right, we need to pause there, but we're gonna come back. But I want to just um, turn everything over to my colleague, Sarah. Um, she has a little message for everybody. Thanks, Meredith. And thanks, Crystal, for such an interesting conversation so far. To be honest, I didn't actually know a ton about photography, but now I might go out and do some stuff today. We'll see. Um, but thanks everyone for spending an hour of your time with us during our Today's Ask the Expert event. 
Um, WGBH is a public service that we provide free of charge, but bringing objective, fast-paced journalism to audience across our radio, TV, and digital platforms has its costs. If you care about the work we do, please consider becoming a sustaining member or making a donation. Today, when you make a gift of $5 a month on our sustainer plan, you can choose to receive these NPR logo pattern socks imprinted with our own 89.7 WGBH, which is Boston's local NPR logo as a thank you gift. These socks are unisex, soft, comfortable, and machine washable. I actually have a pair of these socks. I wear them all the time. They're so good. Uh, now more than ever, it's crucial to stay informed of what is happening in the world and your backing helps us provide information you can trust along with events you can enjoy. You can give $5 a month or $60 all at once, whatever works for you. And to do so, please go to wgbh.org slash support events. And to make that super easy for you, we actually just put the link in the chat. So go ahead and click the link wherever it is on your screen and contribute what you can. Thanks again for joining us. Now back to you, Meredith and Crystal. Thank you so much. And just everybody, I've been at WGBH for 20 years, always working in editorial and content. And I really have come to see how um, public support makes such a difference and really does make things like this happen. So thank you from me. Um, and to my colleagues, I want a pair of those socks. I, Crystal May as well, too. I have not seen those yet. So, um, but let's get back. Let's try to do some more quick questions. Um, Crystal, you good? Okay. Um, let's see here. Could you, could both of you please describe your first professional assignment? What was it and how did you get it? Oh. Hmm. Sorry, long pause. <laughs> My first professional assignment. Um, gosh, I don't know. I would almost consider this project that I did with Persia as like my per first professional assignment. Um, gosh, I put in the work like a professional, that's for sure. Um, I actually was interning at WGBH when I started that project. Um, and it ended up being my professional project for my grad, um, grad school final big project um, for the end of my program. And so just like the work that, you know, that has to go into these projects, I think is for me is kind of like, you know, just what made it professional. I think I followed Persia around, gosh, at one point I knew the amount of time, but I, I want to say maybe five months and then I pitched it to Dig Boston. And then from there, after I pitched it to Dig Boston, they said yes immediately. However, again, because of like the content and like what Persia story um, entailed. They asked if she can sign like a release form. However, I like lost contact with Persia. Um, she just, she wasn't, she had like a new phone number. She was no longer at the job that she used to work at. Like I literally went to where she volunteered down like in Fenway um, and I could not get a hold of her. So I think in total, like from the first photograph that I took of Persia, our our pre-interview to like when it was finally published with Dig Boston, that was like, it was almost like 12 months in total. So that was, I think one of like my big, like major stories. It was something that I, I was passionate about. Um, and it was nerve wracking too, because that also was a big part of like, oh, are you gonna graduate or not? So, um, you know, I, I gave it, you know, a hundred and like 50%, it was, um, Definitely, it was it was exciting. Though. It was thrilling. Um, Y'all should really read this project. It um, I I love it so much. I got to, you know, experience Persia's life, and I'm thankful for that. I also got to, um, I just got to do so many things with her and like really get to know her. So that there was just, like this one night that I walked um, Blue Hill Ave with her. Um, and it was from like 11 p.m. till 2 a.m. And she was doing work, like passing out material and like contraception and telling folks where they could go to um, to get any sort of like help, like health help that they needed with her organization in Roxbury. So, yeah, I would say that that was like my first major project and I, I enjoyed every moment of it. Yeah. And so so I have a very different um an unusual way too, but I want to highlight, like, I think that crystal is, it really highlights that um, many newer photojournalists, there's a real like scrappiness needed to mm -hmm. finding a story and digging in and making it happen and then pushing to get it published. And mm -hmm. Mine is very different. And I will tell you really quickly, um, I've been at GBH a long time, as I mentioned, and I had just 
previously been a digital producer and I was working on a project about the Paralympics. It was called Metal Quest. Um, and we were getting ready to go over to London to sort of finish our storytelling, um, at, which was video focused. And I sort of noted that it would be good, social media was had taken off and was really important that it would be good for us to have still photography so that we could immediately publish photos as we were there rather than waiting for these videos that would turn around, would take longer to turn around. So I just, asked my bosses, I volunteered. And I said, we need this. Here's why I think we need this. I have, and I had a free place to stay. I said, if you let me go, I have a free place to stay. And they said, go. So then I found myself at the 2012 Paralympic Games in London. So I just want to say that is highly unusual. And nobody should set that a bar like that for being, you know, as your first assignment. It all happened because of my long history at GBH and everything else that I was doing. I think Crystals is much more representative of, of how things go. So let's um, let's keep going. Uh, I don't know that I know the answer to this one. How do you get rid of red circles on photos taken in low light or sunsets? This is Phyllis from Burlington. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I don't know that I know of a low light situation where that happens necessarily. I, I can think like maybe sunspots or like if you're photographing something that's like, directly in the sun um yeah my inclination is just to like move away from the sun like just because the just the way it's like bouncing off of like the reflector that's what it's like creating these like circles and like I mean sometimes it's like really beautiful like these rings and they kind of look like rainbows within the the portrait or like the photograph um but if I'm thinking about what you're thinking about correctly I would just say um you know you your camera shouldn't be like in direct sunlight then you have to you know tweak it turn it a little bit to where you're not getting that sun flare in, in yeah your frame. yeah I was thinking it's either um, sunspots or just flare uh in some way and so google those two things um and and you'll get sorry we're doing that but um you'll definitely find more information for how to how to deal with that mm -hmm. All right. Uh, how do I make a time exposure on my mobile phone, or is that possible at all? Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking time lapse. Is that the same thing? Yeah. Uh, I know. I know. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Meredith. No, no. I mean the the iPhone. I know has time lapse option now. The later iPhones, but but go ahead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what I. Yeah, that's what I'm. I was thinking. Like, there's just there's like the time lapse option. Um, I'm not sure if you can like set an exposure to like stay open longer in in a phone. Um, I haven't really played around with that before. Yeah. So what Crystal's referring to is, um, you know, in a, a DSLR camera, mm -hmm. if you put it on a tripod, you can set a very long exposure. So if things are moving. Um, you'll get the movement of those. Um, the other thing I would say about a mobile phone, I, and tell me if I'm right, Crystal, that a person could take a series of pictures. You'd want to keep the camera very still on some sort of tripod, and then every, you decide, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, two minutes, take, a, take an image with mm -hmm. the exact same frame, and then there are ways to stitch them together. Mm -hmm. So to play them out and that, you know, you're sort of overlaying them like this. Mm -hmm. and that would give you a time-lapse effect so but google that mm -hmm. um sure. also <laughs> as well too mm -hmm. so um robin is asking how did you first get into photography which i think we touched on a little bit but mm -hmm. here let's go with this part um do you have any favorite photographers who inspire your work yeah um gosh i think the major one is like gordon parks who was born in like 1912 um he passed away in like 2006 so he lived a very long life and got to see like so many things and i'm i say you know his when he was born and when he passed just because um he photographed to me like he he captured the black experience and i think he did that so well throughout like these different time frames um, I don't know, you know, if anyone here has watched um, Lovecraft Country, um, which I think just aired on HBO on Sunday. Um, the director of that that series like used a couple of like Gordon Parks photographs from the series that he did in Alabama in 1956, I believe, the 1950s. Um, the director used some of like or was inspired by some of the photos that Gordon Parks had like taken back then. Um, so you see some of the same frames that Gordon Parks photographed in the, the photo essay is called Segregation 
in the South and it's in the, the 1950s. Um, so you see some of those same frames um, from his project also in this series. So um, yeah, his work has been like an inspiration to I think so many people. That's one of one of my big favorites. Yeah, Crystal and I were talking about this and I earlier and I said, who's your favorite? And I was like, oh, mine, one of mine too. So I uh, really incredible work. Yeah, we have, uh, we both have others too. And we can send that around if you're looking for, for more recommendations. Um, here's one from Shannon O'Callaghan. What is something that visual storytelling can do that writing can't necessarily achieve? You know, I, I think for some folks, like seeing is believing, like, and I think that's kind of what interest me about photography. I think the other thing that um, photography can do that writing can't, like photography is universal. Um, it's a universal language. And I think that when people see a photograph, like, you know, you can feel whatever it is, like whether it's like this happy scenario or it's a little more moody, it feels sad. Um, I think no matter what language you speak or where you come from, you can kind of feel that in a photograph. And sometimes like when it's written in a piece, like you don't necessarily have that same, you know, the, the language is different for some folks. Okay. So I would definitely say that's one of the big reasons why I love photography is because it's universal. And I think it also, I think photos add context and like clarity to stories as well um you know some people are just more visual so it's nice to see whatever it is um even if it's said in an article to see what that looks like you know i think sometimes when i read my mind goes to like hmm like what does that even look like and i immediately google to see what that is so yeah i love both that i really like the way you you think about that um next one from nancy what instructions if any do you give to people for portraits? So I think this is, yeah, how, how, would, what in, how would you sort of help somebody to take portraits? Mm -hmm. I would say that with photojournalism, I feel like I kind of get off a little bit like easier just because, you know, I don't normally go in like really trying to pose people. Like what I go in with is like, okay, what is the story? what is like the mood, the mood and like the tone of that piece. And then I basically go back to when I'm photographing whoever the person is, whatever the, whoever the subject is. Um, I just kind of reminds them of like, okay, like, you know, what did you say to like X, Y, and Z? Um, you know, how did you feel when you were being interviewed about this story? And then kind of like to channel that. Um, and then from there, people for the most part kind of just begin to like settle into those poses it feels like and I just want folks to be comfortable usually um, at the end of the day so um, I don't always give people direction however the, my big thing is I will say you know maybe chin up or to the you know move your head to the right move your head to the left um, I do usually start with though like how do you feel like most comfortable like with your hands on your hip your hands in your pockets um and then I start from there and sometimes like I just make like subtle tweaks um from there yeah I'll add a couple of things um one conceptual and another technical which is um you know if you're if you're doing studio portraits of somebody and they're there for a headshot it you know they'll, they're going to convey what they want to convey and it's your job to get the lighting right and you know and and, and talk to them in the way Crystal has mentioned and um, but if you're wanting to sort of do a portrait that actually has more story to it or something like that, you know, I, I often am photographing people after our journalists have been through to talk to them and they may have talked, they may have shared a very difficult story and then I show up two days later and we're having a nice chat and I lift my camera up and they're all smiles because that's the way they're feeling in that moment. And so what I usually ask people to do if I see that or if they just seem uncomfortable is I ask them to go back to the conversation they had with the reporter, like to bring that back inside. And I think that technique of talking with somebody, getting a sense of, you know, if they've hired you to take their picture, what do they want to convey mm -hmm. in that photo? And then asking them to kind of step into that, I think that could be helpful. And then just another quick thing, um, many of you have probably heard people refer to, refer to portrait lenses. Um, and so you should Google that, but um, often people when they're doing portraiture, not always, but often you, you try to separate the person away from the background. The background might be visible, but it's usually blurred a little bit because mm -hmm. most 
the goal of most portraits is to really have the person come through. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's not always, but um, I would say read up on portrait lenses or just techniques for adjusting your camera to do to get a portrait effect. That would be one thing I would add. Yeah, one thing that immediately comes to mind when you say that, Meredith, is um, looking for a lens that has like um, like like a 1.8 lens, meaning the the photo will have more blur in the background and like more separation from the subject to the background. So um, I would say kind of just like keeping that in mind when you're looking for portrait lenses as well as a, a, a prime lens. Yeah. So one that doesn't zoom. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll get geeky for a second, but a common portrait lens is like an 85, 85 1.8 or 1.4. The 1.4 is gonna be a lot more expensive. Sometimes people go up to 105, mm -hmm. even a 50 millimeter lens. Um, but go Google that and geek out on it. Um, you'll learn a lot more about that. Um, Robin asks also, are there jobs that include photography or and other passions that you may have? I am passionate about photography, clothing, travel space, and video making. Are there jobs that include in that part? Yeah. Do you understand the question there? Um, I, I mean, I think so. Uh, my like immediate question or my immediate thought or like answer is just like thinking some some sort of like blogging um, that this person could potentially do. Um, whether that's like blogging for yourself or like also like there's influencer photography now too, which is like just a big thing because of like Instagram and like folks are are like curating their feeds. Um, so finding maybe like an influencer that you're interested, like you like that this person is always traveling or like they're interested in like food. So you can like photograph their food or like if they're interested in fashion, you know, you can make those connections with those influencers or just like people in general who want to like curate a more like specific style for a feed. Um, if I'm understanding the, the question that correctly, I would say that that's a, a good route to go. And it's, there's some, there's like lots of money in that too. So depending on, you know, who you're, you're helping out, what influencer, so. Okay, great. Let's try to do some more rapid ones again right. too. So that means we're going to tell you to look certain things up likely, but um, mm -hmm. we definitely have had a number of questions about camera settings. So how do you decide when to use shutter preferred, exposure preferred, or you you know adjust do unique ISO settings versus automatic? So let's we'll be really brief here, and then um, we absolutely are sending you more things to read on all these things. Mm -hmm. So when you think about shutter uh, shutter priority, um, how can I explain this briefly? Um, when you think about shutter, like shutter has to do with light, but also like the longer your shutter is left open, the more movement you're going to get like from a subject. So if someone's like, you know, a soccer and they're like kicking the ball, um, you actually want your shutter to be, I just, <laughs> I'm trying to think, I'm thinking about like the dial of like the, the shutter. So you want it to be open for less amount of time so that you have like, well, it actually depends on what you want to convey. But if you want a sharp photo, like you want your shutter to be open for a less amount of time. So like a fraction of a second um, so that you catch that motion, um, you freeze that motion. And then if you want that motion to blur, you want to open up your shutter like a whole lot more. Um, so, so that's what I would use shutter priority for like if you're doing something that has to do with movement and if you want to freeze it or if you want to blur it blur it out and then aperture priority i would say like if you're taking a portrait um i would use aperture priority um i'm thinking like 1.8 means the aperture is open wider which means you're going to get more blur in the background and if your aperture is at uh, 5.6 or like something higher usually that's when things start to all be in like sharp plain view um so that's that's what i would use those different priority settings for um before moving on to the next question just i would if you hear um crystal and i when we get this question about you know shutter aperture mm -hmm. iso like th this is like the core of photography in many ways and um it there it aren't simple answers and I think what we're headlining for you is learn about them a little bit more and then experiment. That is really because there isn't a single answer for a situation. It really depends on the, what you're seeing and how you want to capture it. I would just say for now, but let's keep going here. 
Um, we're, we actually only have time for one more question. Um, so here's one. You mentioned the grid on the phone a little bit earlier. Can you say more about using the grid on your phone and what is the rule of thirds, which is what the grid is based on? So if you could tell people what the grid is and then talk about the rule of thirds. Sure. So like, I want to use my hands. Like the grid is like, <laughs> it's like, um, there's like three rows and then three columns basically. And like the rule of thirds is like, usually in photography, they tell you like, I feel like rules in photography are just like made to be broken once you understand like what you're doing. Um, but the rule of thirds, usually like you're putting a subject either to like the far left or like the far right of the, um, of the frame. And then your eye kind of like starts at that subject and then usually will go around to like see what else is in the frame. Um, so essentially, yeah, rule of thirds is like just placing your subject. You can put them in like the bottom right corner. You can put them at the top um, in the left corner. You can put them all the way to the left, all the way to the right. It's essentially just like not placing your subject directly in the middle. Um, and then also, yeah, you can you can set your grid on your at least I know on your iPhone you can turn your your grid on to like kind of like practice that and like you you'll be able to see kind of um even if you put the person in like where the lines intersect that would be like the rule of thirds just like not directly like in the middle box if that makes sense yep yeah so everybody if you have I mean we I'm, I'm an iPhone too I think you're an iPhone right, right there it is in the settings there turn it on but also just google rule of thirds it will come up you'll see what the grid looks like you can read about it it's a really easy thing you can do to start improving your framing mm -hmm. um, so thank you so we are going to go back to Sarah for a minute and then Crystal I have one last question for you before we end and I just also want to say we this has gone by so quickly so over to Sarah and then we'll be back Thanks guys. Um, I just want to thank everyone so much for tuning in to today's Ask the Expert event. It was such an interesting conversation and I feel like I learned so much. But to allow us to continue to produce content like this, we ask you to become a sustaining member at just $5 a month, which is $60 a year. And when you do so, we will thank you with a pair of these NPR logo pattern socks, which they also have our 89.7 WGBH, uh, Boston's local NPR logo on them. To make it easy for you, we're going to put the link back in the chat so you can go ahead and click that. And thank you guys for tuning in and supporting WGBH. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Crystal, so one last question and let's like rapid fire answer it together. So because really people are a lot of people are on here to just get some easy stuff for improving their photography. So let's together like come up with a short list of what are some really simple things people can do to just up their game? I, you, I actually think somebody asked about one, which is turn on that grid on your camera, learn about it and start using it. It will help your composition. What else comes to mind? Simple things. Yeah, yeah one thing that um, we haven't chatted about yet is the use of like golden hour, which is the last hour of the day before the sun sets. And then the first hour of the day, like as the sun is like, starting to rise um, and golden hour just means that there, there's like beautiful soft light, um, not too many harsh shadows just yet. I would say also if you're scheduling a shoot and it's going to be outside, definitely um, stay away from like noon where the sun is like right above like your head um, and it just like creates harsher shadows on people unless like you can find some shade somewhere. Um, so I would say golden hour and then also blue hour is really interesting. It's like but that's even a shorter window of time. It's like right as the sun has completely set, there's like 30 minutes where like there's just like this beautiful like bright blue light outside. Um, and then the same with just before the sun rises. So pay attention to those two things, I would say. I'm going to add two quick things, which is like look at other people's work and like just start to pay attention to the kinds of things they might be doing. Um, and then the last thing I think I've already said it, but it's just practice, practice, practice. Like. Crystal and I don't do what we do today because we've taken lots of photos. We've taken lots of bad photos. Um, and really just like, I used to practice, I would sit in my apartment in the winter and I would photograph things in my apartment just to learn better about my camera settings. So uh, that's my big headline. Like no one became a good photographer by taking pictures, you know, every other weekend. It's, it's work in practice. And I, I don't know about you, Crystal, but I still take some really bad photos. Like it happens. Yeah, it, it does happen. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so sorry. This this has been really fun for me. And even though we can't see you, everybody, it's great to not see you. And um, 
have you here. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. Thank you to my colleagues for making this so smooth and easy. And thank you, Crystal, for being here and for talking about your experience and sharing all the wisdom and insights you have. Um, how, can people, how can people follow you, reach out to you, contact you? Sure. So everything, uh, Instagram and Twitter are both at C Mills, C M I L Z three, two, one, one. Um, and then also like, if you just, you can check out my email at stat stat news. Um, if you want to contact me that way. So, okay. I'm Meredith Beerman photo on Instagram. That's the best way, but, um, we're going to post, um, all that info in the chat, but we know you're, most of you are probably logging out soon. So it will also be in the resources that we'll send around. So, all right. Thank you again. Enjoy, Bye. enjoy your Friday. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye.